All right, so uh, this <laughs> this two-part lecture just kind of turned into a three-part lecture. One, uh, the last lecture was getting pretty long. It was already nine minutes, and I still have quite a bit more to cover. And two, I moved uh, past this problem, and I remembered that there's some really cool aspects about this problem uh, that I wanted to discuss. So this is what the last lecture ended on, was this practice problem, and then we were going to move forward into EVA. But before we move forward into EVA, I figured I would add this third part and start this off by discussing this problem a little more. Uh, if possible, I'm going to try to edit this into the last lecture, but I'm not that tech savvy, so editing the videos might not happen. So before we get to EVA, I wanted to talk through this a little bit. And what this problem says is that we have two divisions and uh, their relative performance is assessed by residual income. And the way that they calculate residual income, it's your income minus required rate of return times investment. And the way that they calculate investment is total assets minus total or current liabilities. And that's an interesting adjustment is to take out these current liabilities. Uh, but it makes sense for the most part. You want to remove current liabilities from total assets because a lot of times those current liabilities are the offset to things that are in our asset category that haven't been paid yet. So essentially these are asset they're, they're not assets that the firm has invested in right so it's not part of the actual investment so the the firm wouldn't require some return on those assets because they're still liabilities they haven't been paid so you want to uh, take that out of the calculation because otherwise it's kind of harming the manager that they're not getting or they're being penalized for this investment that hasn't actually happened yet. But then this next part says the NCD division manager says, hey, taking out these liabilities, that's not fair because this PPD manager is manipulating that. They're taking on a lot of current liabilities and potentially even offsetting, decreasing their assets. And you can imagine this is uh, they could even, instead of just loading up on short-term debt, so reducing investment, maybe they're even, uh, instead of buying equipment to manufacture parts, maybe they're outsourcing. So they're buying stuff that are going into sales, but that's the payable to that client or the supplier that they're outsourcing through is a current liability. So they're hitting both ends. They're decreasing total assets and increasing current liabilities which this helps the division manager, but it's probably harmful to the firm. So they say, okay, well, let's change this calculation and take out that short-term debt. What, is the, what does the change look like? Or what do the calculations look like now? But I just wanted to hit this again. One, to let you guys know why we take out current liabilities, or we often take out current liabilities, but then to make you guys remember that, that we have different hats as managerial accountants, and one hat is to really investigate uh, these performance measures. And unfortunately, it's kind of the dark hat we have to put on, but we have to assume, or assume if we were this manager, what are all the different ways we could manipulate this to increase our income or our bonus that is detrimental to the firm? And so this is one way that if we, we'd have to look and make sure that our employees, or our managers weren't doing this method here by loading up on short term debt, uh, because that is beneficial to the manager it makes them money, but it is detrimental to the firm. So I just wanted to look over this problem again and remind you guys that that is a hat we have as managerial accounts that we always have to be aware of. We need to look at these contracts and really make sure that people can't manipulate these. And if they are, we should catch that and make adjustments. Okay, so now let's get into EVA, economic value added. And this is basically a different type of residual income, where our last one was income minus required rate of return times investment. 
The only changes here is now we're focused on after-tax income. This is very important. Make sure you remember that. And instead of required rate of return, we're using the WAC, the Weighted Average Cost of Capital. Hopefully you guys are very familiar with that from prior accounting and finance classes. And then again, our investment in this calculation is always assets minus current liabilities. And so it's basically the same thing. It's the residual income or the after-tax income you have left over after accounting for the true cost of your capital. Where residual income uses the required rate of return, which can be adjusted by companies or by executives. EVA uses the actual weighted average cost of capital. So this is the true amount that the company is paying for these assets. So those are the big difference. It's after-tax operating income, and it uses the WAC instead of the required rate of return. Um, we'll get into real quick, just a refresher on how you calculate WAC. But the other thing that we want to recognize are is this is a big item down here. Pay attention to this, blah, 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 blah. And this says that unrecorded and tangible assets such as R&D or advertising expense, that these will be added back to after-tax operating income and then also added as assets. And we'll get into in a minute why that's important, but make sure you understand that these unrecorded intangibles get added back to income, so it increases income. If we spent $1,000 on advertising, we add that, add, we remove that expense from the income statement, thereby increasing after-tax income by $1,000, and we'd add that $1,000 to assets, and then we just amortize that normally as we would an asset every year. And we'll get to why we do that. So just a refresher on WAC, um, weighted average cost of capital. This calculation, it's pretty dang straightforward. It just says, this is the interest that you're gonna pay on your debt. So it's your cost of debt, your interest rate times the market value. So this is debt interest plus, this is the interest you're gonna pay on your equity. The cost of equity times the market value of equity. So this is kind of equity interest over the total amount. So all we're saying is, it's your interest, it's your interest rate, essentially, for your debt and equity put together. So it's total interest over total value, and that just gets you to your interest rate overall. This is your weighted average cost of capital or your weighted average interest. And so let's use, plug in these numbers. We have 9% cost of debt, 12% cost of equity, 400 million in debt, that's a lot of debt, 600 million in equity. So let's plug that in, pretty easy. Uh, we have to remember that this is a big one. This is after tax. And as we see down here, that's our cost of debt times our one minus our tax rate. This is the market value of debt, our cost of equity, market value of equity over our total market value. So this just says we pay 6.3% of interest on debt, 12% of interest on equity. So average together, we pay about 9.7% interest overall. Pretty straightforward. You guys should be very familiar with this calculation. So here's, we're back to these two divisions. Uh, and this time it just says, hey, calculate the EVA for each division. I'll let you guys move forward with that. So, well, uh, as I said, I'll let you guys work through that. The answers we posted in the slides. So let's do a real quick example of why those adjustments should be important. And these are the adjustments that EVA makes for those unrecorded intangibles. So imagine... We're at Deloitte, we're an advisory, and you know that as a new hire, uh, you'll be going to their Deloitte University. Uh, Deloitte University started when I was there. I was among the first group of seniors that got to go, and it is fantastic. 
Uh, it's a great location. The coolest part about it is, uh, not the coolest part, but a cool part about it is they have a Starbucks built in and it's really odd that you go in, you get your coffee, you can grab a sandwich and then you look around and you can just leave. Like you don't pay everything there is free and it's super awkward feeling to get your product, get your coffee and just walk away without paying. But anyway, that's a side note. Deloitte University, it's awesome. And people go there every year to train. And these are made up numbers, but let's assume the cost per employee to train is about $12,000. And that Deloitte will assume, I don't know, but uses EVA to measure performance and calculate partners' bonuses. So that training is an actual expense. And we don't want, right, because our EVA is income after tax minus our uh, WAC times assets minus current liabilities. So this after tax income portion, training is an expense that will reduce that income. And if partners bonuses depend on increasing that income, well, they may say, you know what, it's not worth it for me to send my employees to training. So Deloitte wants to adjust. They want to say we want partners to feel incentivized to invest in training because we want them to have that long-term perspective to invest in this training. So they add that back into income. But knowing they add it back, what if a partner says, well, shoot, if we're going to add it back to income, well, then I'm not going to send them to Deloitte University for $12,000. I'm going to send them to Italy for $24,000. We're all going to go there and have a big party, right? Because it's added back, they think, well, dang, this won't, Im this won't impact my income at all, so we can all go to, to Italy. And at the firm level, is this a good idea? Well, no because they're probably getting the same training in Italy or maybe even less than at Deloitte University. So it's not really helping the firm overall. It's probably hard or hurting the firm because it's doubling the cost of the training. So what adjustments does EVA require for this that can prevent this? Well, not only do we add back the costs into the after-tax income, but we also add the costs back here into assets. So that means that for all the years to come, right, because this training only gets added back to income this year, the training expense, but that's going to be an asset now on the books for performance measurement purposes that in the future, every year, even though it's going to be slowly amortized, that they, in the future, every year, that partner is going to have to pay interest on that asset of the training. And so, sure, it might help them this year, but every year from now on, it's going to lower their EVA. So really, this uh, kind of promotes the partner taking a long-term focus, saying, hey, actually, we won't go to Italy this year because... All in all future years, I'm going to have to pay interest on the amount of money I get for going to or that I, I consume for training in Italy. All right. So EVA, really, that adjustment, it helps promote uh, managers to think long term and only do things like training, advertising, if it won't hurt them this year. And it's going to be worth it in the long run. It's worth it for them to pay interest on this. Is uh, as that asset's being amortized. So it's really a creative uh, adjustment that EVA makes that really helps promote this long-term outcome for managers or this long-term view for managers. And that's just saying, that's answering the question on the previous slide that what does EVA do to adjust for this? Well, it will increase after-tax operating income for the expense but it'll also increase the asset by that amount. And then in the next year, 
it won't affect operating income and the asset will be amortized. So if it's a five year asset in the next year, it'll have four fifths of that asset left and you'll only be paying the interest on four fifths of that asset. So just amortize like any other asset. So here's another sample EBA problem for you guys to work through. As I said, the uh, solutions these probably posted online. So what did we learn? Well, overall in this lecture series, we learned what to consider when developing and implementing performance measures and evaluation process. Uh, the big questions are, hey, is the proposed performance measure consistent with the manager's decision authority? Can they really influence this performance measure? We need to use, we need to incentivize employees based on things that they can actually influence. Uh, are the incentives aligned with firm performance? And these bottom two kind of go together. That says, hey, we as, as uh, managerial accountants, we have to put on that hat and we have to make sure that the way that we're incentivizing our employees aligns with uh, the firm's goals. And is there any way that managers can manipulate those incentives to take advantage of receiving their bonus, but actually harming the firm? So those are things we need to be aware of. And this is the big takeaway that the reason we have all these performance measures is because none of them are perfect. We have to pick and choose uh, which ones are best in our scenario. And then we can even make adjustments to those like we saw in EVA or in the residual income practice problem uh, to try to help offset any issues we have with our managers. Um, so, yep, that's it for uh, this uh, section. Make sure you do your homework, get it submitted online. And also the solutions to the practice problems are at the end of this slide deck. And I've included a few additional practice problems. So I highly recommend you work through all these problems, including the practice problems. And keep setting up meetings with your group and chat about these and make sure everybody has a good understanding because we know one of the ways you learn is by teaching others. So if you understand these practice problems, make sure to join your group and see if you can help teach others because that won't only help them, but it'll really be a benefit to you as well. All right, thanks a lot guys, and we'll see you at the next lecture.